Lord, we ask you to bless our meeting and to do uh, your will with us so that would be uh, the fulfillment of everything good for your will is good. And hear us when we call upon you through the name of your Son, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. All right, so I, w I was thinking of uh, today as the beginning of this journey, actually. So this should be the beginning of our uh, meetings and talks in the journey to uh, explore the church, the Coptic church. Uh, so I thought the beginning of it should be a little bit of a history. Um, and you can interrupt me at any point and ask questions. Um, so that just to know where we are, where we stand and where we trace our our roots. And as you know, both of you know that uh, the Coptic Orthodox Church is a traditional church and it has a really long history. Whether um, whether there is um, things we do or things that we believe or things that we anticipate, it's all coming from that very long history. So um, I want to start with that and then we can uh, we can move on to different subjects. I'll share with you something. Um, it's a familiar thing. It's, a, it's what we call a timeline. And that timeline um, tells us where everything happened in the history of Christianity following Jesus. So the first century is where the church starts. And then this is the bigger picture. This is how it looks. I'm just focusing on the beginning from the left side. It's in the first century when Jesus um, appeared on earth and he uh, was incarnate, was made a human being into through uh, birth through St. Mary. And then also uh, was crucified and rose from the dead on the third day, ascended to heaven. And according to the gospel in the book of Luke, a book of Acts, <clears throat> the apostles seen him ascending to heaven. And uh, they, they were with him in the 40 days after his resurrection. And they began witnessing for that. That happened in the first century. Um, so this is the origin. And we call the church that started then from the day of Pentecost, the apostolic church. So this is the apostolic church. We call it the church of the apostles, where the uh, 12 apostles and the 70 missionaries that Jesus had uh, called were living. Things continued the same way. Um, we have sparse recorded history of the details of all the spread of the gospel, but we have traditions from everywhere. Uh, we have traditions from all the uh, traditional churches about what happened in each of the places the apostles went to. The book of Acts have the beginning of that. So the book of Acts says, between the first century and the first council in 325, there were five hubs of Christianity. We know that from the local tradition. So for example, our Alexandrian tradition, if I go into the Alexandrian tradition, um, so the patriarchs of Alexandria, Um, he would will trace the patriarchs to St. Mark and um, you would have a list of them. Here you go. <clears throat> and, and this is actually a reported history in, um, in um, what we call the history of the patriarchs of Alexandria. So there is a, there is a, a lineage that started with St. Mark. So this is like the line from St. Mark to a patriarch, his name was Theones. Uh, this is a book actually written by historians. And these historians write it all the way uh, to uh, 1894. So there is a history of the patriarchs of Alexandria to 1894. This history is not only in, kept in the Coptic church, but also in other places, for example, 
The second patriarch of Alexandria is Inyanus. And I want to tell you about that because it has a very nice. Inyanus is the second uh, patriarch of Alexandria. And he's, he's called Pope Inyanus of Alexandria. They were called popes in the beginning. <coughs> Pope Inyanus was the second patriarch of Alexandria. It was ordained by Saint Mark the Evangelist. Uh, we see this, right? You yeah. Right? yeah, you can yes. see it. So there's this beautiful icon here. This, this is Venetian. This is done by uh, the thieves of Italy when they took the body of Saint Mark. They made this. It's a huge picture. It's very high resolution. Um, let me just get out of here. And it's this man, if you can focus on it. This man has a box here, and he's a shoe maker or a fixer. This is St. Mark. This is Italian. This is not uh, Coptic, has nothing to do with the Coptic art. And this is how they imagine St. Mark going through Alexandria. And this should be the lighthouse of Alexandria, it's something to symbolize the city. And this is the man who was a shoemaker. St. Mark sandal, she can get this out a little bit bigger. Um, I have it. It's actually uh, I made uh, two copies of it, um, so that we 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 see this. He was a shoemaker. Saint Mark going through the city of Alexandria. His sandal was torn. Found this shoemaker on the street. He asked him to fix his sandals. The man, using a needle to fix the sandal, pierced his hand, and he screamed, "Oh, the only God!" And then uh, Saint Mark said, "Well, that's very interesting." At the time of St. Mark visiting Alexandria in the first century, Alexandria was polytheistic. There were Romans and Greeks at the same time and ancient Egyptians. The three sects, the Romans, the Greek, the ancient Egyptians were all polytheistic. The only group that was a major group in Alexandria at the time are the Jewish group. So he felt that this man might be a Jew or you know, affiliated with the local Jewish community. He said, do you believe in one God? He said, yes, I do. So do you know? His son, he said, no, I don't know his son. I didn't know that he had a son. He started speaking to him about Jesus. This was the first convert in, in Egypt. And after St. Mark was martyred, he was dragged, they tie a rope around his head, the Romans and the Egyptians actually, and dragged him in an exchange until his head was severed. Uh, he had already ordained and named Inyanus to be his successor. And this was the story of Alexandria. We might go through this again, but I will just briefly tell you about this history um, of this time. The history of the time between um, the first century, between the first century, which is the origin of our faith, and 325. So in each of those big five hubs that I said in the world, in the, in, the, in the ancient world, Americas were not. Americas, Australia, were not discovered then. So you have five big hubs of Christianity that started in the first century and moved on. So let me tell you about those five hubs. After the, of course, the Christian, uh, the first Christian church was established in Jerusalem. In the book of Acts, it's the upper room in the house of St. Mark's mother, Mary, her name was Mary, and in Jerusalem, that's the upper room where Jesus made, um, he, he washed the feet of his disciples and he made uh, the first Eucharist and he uh, visited the disciples many time after his resurrection in the upper room. This was the mother of all churches, the church at Jerusalem. When the apostles were commissioned, were commissioned from this upper room. When they returned from their journeys, they returned to that upper room where Peter, John, James, especially James, were centered and established over there as the apostles of the Lord. So from the Church of Jerusalem, the next hop in the book of Acts would be Antioch, Syria. There's two Antiochs, Antioch, Syria and Antioch, Turkey. We're talking about Antioch, Syria. So in Antioch, they moved to Antioch when there was a great persecution after the death of Stephen. Everybody has to flee except James. And they went to Antioch and they established the next hub of Christianity. From there, 
The third hub of Christianity was Rome. When both Peter and Paul arrived in Rome um, in the around 60 AD, in the 60s AD. And from there, when St. Peter died, St. Mark, his companion, who was a younger man then, uh, left Rome and came to Alexandria, Egypt. This is the story I just told you about. It's around 68, 67, 68 AD. Then you have in those four hubs, um, I name again, uh, Jerusalem, Antioch, by the way, the Antioch church is where the followers of Christ were called Christians first. The uh, the Antiochian church or the Syrian Orthodox church is very proud to say this is the place where everyone was called a Christian. Before that, they were called the disciples of the way. And uh, so Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria. Then later, maybe later than here, than 325, uh, or in 325, maybe around that time, Constantine the Great had conquered the Roman Empire and made it one empire under him and actually allowed Christianity to flourish by the decree of Milan in 314. 314, he established that, um, or 312, to, you know, to be accurate. So 10 years later, he had the Council of Nicaea. But he had already um, founded the city of Constantinople as the new capital of the Roman Empire. And there you have the fifth hub of Christianity. So name them again, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. And the three is mentioned in the book of Acts. Then Alexandria, and then Constantinople 200 years later. So um, around 200 years later. So these are the, this is the early history. And in each church of the main, of those main five churches, you have a very detailed, vivid recording of the service and, and the struggles of the church in those years. You have it there written um, in their own history of their popes and patriarch, for example, Rome is very notorious about keeping the re records of the popes. So you have uh, Peter as their first. That's what they say. But uh, we might have a little bit of a, a, a criticism of that. Might Peter might be the, visiting there, but it, we think it's St. Paul who did it. But in any way, they think of Peter or Pope as their first pope. And then you have another one. And then uh, the fourth from Peter is Clement of Rome. And as a church, we in Alexandria, consider him a saint and a martyr. And we uh, keep his writings very close. Especially Clement of Rome is, is one of the famous writers in the patristic writing of the church. So this is up to this time. But what happened in here uh, that necessitated a council, Council of Nicaea? Before we go there, there was a council here. We don't really talk much about it, the Council of Jerusalem. And this council in the first century, around 55 AD or 54, we have uh, the new church among the Gentiles led by the missions of Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, and the work of Timothy, Titus, uh, these men, very famous men from the uh, book of Acts. They spread the gospel among Gentiles. So they have, in all the places, you have two groups in the first century. A Christian group from a Jewish background and a Christian group from pagan background, from Gentile background, according to the Jews, what they call them. Gentile means they're not Jewish. But they're Christians, both of them. The group of the Jews, there were zealots, very zealous people, maybe Pharisees even, who converted to the faith of Christ. And they were very adamant about they need the need. And you read about the struggle in the New Testament. It's very clear. If you look for it, you'll find it. They said, you cannot turn Gentiles into Christ. 
That's meaningless. Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament, so they have to be Jews first. And then they can turn into Christ. So this is the problem that faced the church in the very beginning. And if you understand this, you would understand 90% of the writing of St. Paul and his letters. So they, um, the, the apostles came together and made a council. It's called the Council of Jerusalem. And they said, this is, you will find this in the book of Acts chapter 15. And they said, no, you don't need to turn anyone into a Jewish person. You don't circumcise anybody. You don't ask anybody to keep the law of Moses. You just baptize them and teach them the commandments of Christ. That's it. And this was the first council. If you can consider that the first, then Nicaea is the second. But if it's not considered the first council, Nicaea is the first. So what happened after that? The biggest problem that faced the church then, again, from the Jewish opponents who said, um, the, the first thing is, is the Judaizers, the same people who said you have to turn people into Jews, they said, we cannot consider Jesus God. That's their the first problem. Cannot consider Jesus God. He's not God. He's the son of God, quote unquote. He's a smaller being than the almighty infinite God. <clears throat> and then the church answered and said, absolutely not. He is God. Uh, so you have a great uh, problem here with the rising of a, a priest from Libya or even from Alexandria itself who said, no, Jesus was not God. Jesus was an angel, a lower rank. And his problem, he says, if you call God, there's only one God. And we've been told many times, that's the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your might. How can you say Jesus is God? Uh, and then if he is praying to his father and he always says, my father is greater than I, and I came to do the will of my father, and they had a big list. So these were uh, the followers of Arius. The one who stood against Arius at the time was uh, a helper of Pope Alexandros. And this had gone too far until almost the empire of Constantine at the time started to divide major, major persons and the big, big people and big names in the uh, Roman Empire had followed the teaching of Arius that made sense to them, that you cannot have only but one God. Does it make sense to have an equal person? So the one who actually said it's absolutely not had to be Saint Athanasius, and Athanasius is a famous name, who defended this in a very beautiful work and it is called the incarnation of the world, of the word, incarnation of the word, the word and the incarnation of Christ, the son of God. And he pointed out and, and proved it by, by logic and by biblical references that it cannot be anyone but the eternal logos of the father that would have to save us. Any being less than that will not do it for us. So St. Athanasius had written this beautiful treaty of defending the faith is the first um, argument against the uh, uh, the uh, the Arians, and it's a very powerful one. It was a big struggle, took all his life, and ended up being exiled many times. When Constantine dies, his son comes and sides with the Arians. At one point, he tells Athanasius, the world is against you because everybody's going after Arius. And uh, Athanasius responded, I, I am against the world. And you hear this famous statement, Athanasius contra mondi, Athanasius against the world. Very, very powerful theologian. And he's responsible for many, many good works that defended the faith against those heretics that text. And here you see, the church is very particular about what we believe. It is not left to us to decide what we think. It's not a matter of opinion. And it's very important that we understand this is very fatal to take faith on a personal feelings. The Nicene uh, Council in 325 uh, formulated the first part of the Nicene Creed. What do we say in the Nicene Creed? We, re we recite it all the time in all our liturgical prayer to make sure that the Nicene Creed stays alive in us. 
that this is how we see it as a church. So that's how it goes. And I tell everyone who is coming to the church, you, we better memorize the Nicene Creed. Uh, the best way to memorize it is to say it once a day uh, loudly, something that we are going to uh, recite together as a community. This is our creed. This is our uh, faith. And if uh, I'm just going to explain to you the Nicene Creed maybe at one point or another, why every point in it is extremely fundamental. And by the way, all the points of the Nicene Creed are biblical verses. They're not man-made, except one word. This is the word, the word that made the difference between Jesus God or not God. That's the word equal. But then there's hints to it. So even that word has hints in it in the Gospels of St. John especially. But every other sentence in the creed comes directly from biblical reference as is. So the first part of it, it says, yes, we, we believe in one God, the Father, Pentecostal, the Almighty, who created heaven and earth of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages. Light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created of one essence with the Father. That one essence with the Father, or, or equal in essence with the Father, is the one that the Arians had tricked big time. But the church had agreed in all its members. Um, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, became man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. He ascended to the heavens and sits at the right hand of his father and he's coming again in his glory to judge the living and the dead, period. This is the piece that the Nicene Creed, the fathers of the Nicene Creed, which were 318 bishops from all over the four major hubs, which is Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria. They came together and made this statement of faith. That's 325. So the church agreed and all it is members represented in those leaders, the bishops, that the, the, the faith in Christ as the true God of true God is to be confirmed. And anyone who speaks against it, it is not actually belonging to the church. So that's where the term orthodox rose. This is important now. So the way or the, the reason why they call them orthodox orthodoxy is this council. So anyone who followed that belief, this creed, is an orthodox versus those who did not believe Jesus is God. And you might say, oh, so I thought that everybody agreed that Jesus is God. No, absolutely not. In the beginning, the church had to really struggle to make that clear to everyone and not to let people actually dive into their own ideas. So uh, came two words, two words, orthodoxy and heresy. So when you say what's orthodoxy, the general definition of it is the mainstream church faith, the mainstream that the collective church, the universal church, what does the church believe? If a person believe what the universal church believe is an orthodox. If a church, if a, if a person does not believe what the, the universal church believe, he's a heretic. And here heretic is not, doesn't mean erroneous, but it means um, a sidewalk or um, um, like a wandering off, off, off the main beaten road, something like that. So this is the first council, the Council of Nicaea. Now, people had already agreed. So Jesus is God, true God of true God. But this heresy didn't die. It keeps coming back over and over and over again. Who doesn't believe that Jesus is God today? I'll tell you. Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, you know, you know them? See them on the bicycles. Yeah, exactly. So these are the, the, the same, the, the people that believe that stuff in the third, in the fourth century, these are the same problem that's coming back over and over. And through history, they came back in, in Spain at one point and led to a major schism in the church. We're going to talk about that in a second. I have a quick question. Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, uh, for these councils, uh, what is their, uh, like, who are they consisted of? Is that just bishops that were, is it a separate bishops? Is it just uh, um, 
deacons from different areas? I mean, who were making these councils up? Okay, so the council was called by um, a considerable, the oldest or the most respectable person in the time. Sometimes it's not really, the, the, the Pope of Rome was not really the head of the church, but they considered him as an older brother at the time. You can see that from the minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the, the one who, so this is how it goes. If you read the history of the council, for example, Arius, who is a heretic, went and started to teach this in Alexandria. Who is the bishop or the pope of Alexandria is Alexandros. So Alexandros sends letter, letters to, first he face him and he's not facing him. So he goes to the bishops of all the four hubs, Jerusalem, Antioch, uh, Rome, and then of course his, his own see. But then they all agree that this is not something uh, orthodox. They, they will not be agreeing with it. And he says, we have to do something about it. We need to nip this in the bud before it becomes a big deal. So he said, the only way we can do this is we go to the, we go to the emperor, to Constantine, and ask him to help us with this thing. Because Constantine is the Roman em emperor, he has, um, he becomes the connecting the connecting tool in this. Because these churches belong to different languages, different nationalities, different everything. So there is no means like today of telephoning or faxing or you know internet, that's not the case. So they have to have a central figure that actually gathered them. So Constantine was the tool actually when he started this council, he sent letters to all the, the bishops and the patriarchs of those churches uh, and they were be, will be named. So he would send it to, I can, we can look into this so I can get you the, um, so let's see, the Council of Nicaea. Um, if I get it from Wikipedia, you can look at the, uh, the history of what happened. So a Council of Christian Bishops convened in Bithynian city in Bithynia, Nicaea, and which is Turkey now. Um, it was the, the Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 325, was the first effort to attain consensus in the church through an assembly representing all Christendom. His Hosius of Cordoba may have presided over its deliberation. So they chose one of them uh, who is known as a very uh, respected person who is maybe an older member of the clergy. The main accomplishment was settlement on the Christological issue of the divine nature of God the Son and his relationship to God the Father. And the construction of the first part of the Nicene Creed, which I just recited, establishing uniform observation. This is another issue. Different Christians at the time celebrated Easter differently. Um, some would say it has to be on the feast of Passover of the Jews. And this is the, our new Passover. It has to be on the 14th, uh, the, the eve of the 15th day of the uh, lunar month and the other churches like Alexandria said absolutely has to be on a Sunday. Jesus rose on a Sunday. Don't just follow the moon. Uh, so when you read uh, the overview, most significantly it's resulted from its uniform Christian doctrine. That's when I say Orthodox called the Nicene Creed with the creation of the creed, a precedent was established for subsequent local and regional councils of bishops to create statements of belief and canons of doctrinal orthodoxy this is this is the the definition so it is adherence to correct or accepted creeds especially in religion so orthodoxy it, it talks about the main line church what is accepted uh, here i know for sure that the non-denominational church would, would shy away from any kind of creed or any, any kind of uh, dogma because this is where the the unifying idea of having everybody come together is to abandon that uh, which which is a problem. I'm going to say this very clearly. It is a problem to uh, to think that we can actually unify people without having uh, an, an understanding of what we believe. So it, intent being to define unity of beliefs of the whole of Christendom. That's what they thought. That the first century on the fourth century fathers of the church thought the way to do this is to unify the faith. To make sure everybody's clear on that item. Um, so that answered my question. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So basically it was a group of bishops and when they, uh, 
they they're responsible for putting together an ASEAN creed, basically. Exactly. So that's it. That's where the leaders of the churches since the beginning. And as I said, if you want, um, let me just share this also. There is a line of bishops in all those churches. You can trace it back all the way to the apostles. And, and at one point or another, so those names appear in that line. So if I get this, uh, let me see if I can get it. So you understand that Alexandros was one of them. Uh, the patriarchs, because I am from the Coptic church, then I know the Coptic bishops. I can tell you who was there from our side. Uh, of, this is just the Catholic side, correct? Uh, the, the Catholic, if you want to talk about Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic at the time. That would be Rome. Then we have to, I'm going to, we're going to, we can look into this actually here. I'm going to tell you who is from Rome. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, attendees, here we go. Constantine had invited uh, 1,800 bishops of the Christian church within the Roman Empire, about 1,000 in the east and 800 in the west. And this is something you notice that the church was east and west based on the common language they use. The east used Greek. The west used Latin. Uh, there is one famous one, Eusebius of Caesarea, counted, that's a historian, 250. Athanasius of Alexandria counted 318. Eustathius and Antioch estimated about 270. All there were present at the council. Later, um, so there is a lot of, uh, okay, so here, Socrates, Scholasticus, they all, the people who counted the numbers. Jerome was there famous Jerome from the Latin church, Dionysius, Exiguus, Rufinus. Um, but the number 318 is preserved in the liturgies of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria. We keep that number, we say, because Athanasius had counted that. So we say it's a 318. Delegates came from every region of the Roman Empire, including Britain, Christian churches extent with the Sassanide Empire, and participating bishops were given free travel to and from their episcopal sees to the council. Um, there were, uh, these bishops did not travel alone. Each one had permission to bring with him two priests and three deacons. So the total number of attendees could have been more or above 1800. So I think what Athanasius had counted is only the bishops. Um, okay, the Eastern bishop. They formed the major, the great majority of these. The first rank was held by the patriarchs Alexander of Alexandria. That this, he, he was always in the icons depicted as an older man. Pope, and, and notice here, he's called Pope. And this is something that we trace back that the, the first patriarchs, the first bishops of Alexandria were the first people to be called popes even before the Pope of Rome. And the, the word comes from the Coptic word, Papa or father of fathers. During the patriarchate, he dealt with a number of issues facing the church in that day. These included the dealing of Easter, the action of Miletus of Lycopolis. It's a, it's a city in Egypt where the bishop ordained bishops with him. Uh, so this is Alexander of Alexandria. He's the 19th, but he's number 19 in this list. If you count Mark as the first, Alexander of Alexandria becomes the 19th. Uh, Eustathius of Antioch, see the second city here uh, of the four. Many of the assembled father, for instance, uh, Baphnotius of Thebes, that's from Egypt. He was a very holy man. He was one of the confessors. It means he was persecuted during the Roman uh, Empire before Constantine. He was actually tortured and he carried a lot of wounds. People respected him a lot in the minutes of the council. Whenever he spoke, everybody listened. Uh, Heraclius, Bishop Butamun, Paul, New Caesarea. Uh, and he had stood, those people had stood as the confessors of faith and came to the council's marks of persecution, like I said, on their faces, made them a very powerful presence and their voices were heard because they suffered for Jesus. This position is supported by the patristic scholar Timothy Barnes in his book, Constantine and Eusebius. Uh, from uh, uh, attendees, Eusebius of Nicomedia, 
Sebius of Caesarea, this is a historian uh, who wrote a lot about this guy. Um, he himself, I think we say sometimes in our history, he himself was an Arian. Um, the purported first church historian, circumstance suggested like Nicholas of Myra, and that's uh, St. Nicholas, your, your good old St. Nick. Um, he's, uh, he's one of the attendees. They say he slapped, <laughs> they say in the tradition that he slapped um, or he punched Arius in the face because he was a very simple man and he just got so angry of Arius saying all kinds of things about Jesus. And Jesus is this, Jesus is that. So he stood up and punched him. He so said, there you speak about the Lord like this. And the, 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 the council was enraged. They quicked him out. They're almost excommunicated, St. Nicholas. And then uh, at night they said the a, a few of the council members had visions to return St. Nicholas and forgive him because he acted out of innocence. Uh, his life was the seed of Santa Claus visions, of course. Macarius of Jerusalem. Let's say, see that the uh, representation of the big cities is there. Um, later, a staunch defender of Athanasius Aristasis of Armenia. He is the son of St. Gregory, the illuminator, this beautiful man who established Christianity in Armenia after suffering perse persecution, vicious persecution by uh, Tredat, the king of Armenia. We might need to look into his story. So Armenia had been a friend of Alexandria for the longest time. It is St. Athanasius who will write the anaphora of the Armenian church. Uh, Leontis of Caesarea, Jacob of Nisibis, a former hermit, uh, Hypatius of Gangra, these are all the names in the cell, uh, Achilles Larissa, um, Spiridon of Terimethos. Uh, he was a shepherd, although he was a bishop. From foreign places came John, Bishop of Persia and India, Theophilus, Gothic bishops, and Stratophilis, Bishop of uh, Betiont in Georgia, up in the north. Uh, then from the Latin speaking provinces, set at least five representatives, Marcus of Calabria from Italia, Calcilian of Carthage from Africa, and this is the predecessor, he's the, the predecessor of Augustine. Uh, Hosius of Cordoba from Hispania, that's from uh, Spain. Uh, Nicasius of D from Gaul, that's France. Domnus of Sirmium from the province of the Danube. Where is the Danube? Uh, Danube River. Athanasius of Alexandria, a young deacon, he was not a bishop then. He went with Alexandrus. And companion of Bishop Alexander of Alexandria was among the assistants. Athanasius eventually spent most of his life battling against Arianism. Alexander of Constantinople, then a presbyter, was also present as a representative of his aged bishop. So they sent representatives. Uh, the supporters of Arius, the other camp, included Secondus of Ptolemaeus, Theonas of Mar Marica, uh, Zephyrus of Zephyrus and Dathis, all of whom hailed from the Libyan Pentapolis, and they're all with Arius because he was from Libya. Other supporters include Eusebius of Nicomedia, uh, Paulinus of Tyrus, Actius of Lydda. Uh, there are few, they were actually at least 20 with him, with uh, Arius. Um, resplendent in purple and gold, Constantine made a ceremonial entrance at the opening of the council, probably in early June but respectfully seated the bishops ahead of himself. He was very respectful of the church. As Eusebius described, Constantine himself proceeded through the midst of the assembly like some heavenly messenger of God, clothed in raiment which glittered as it were with rays of light, reflecting the glowing, he was very uh, ornamented and adorned with the brilliant splendor of gold. The emperor was present as an overseer and presider but did not cast any official vote. He didn't involve himself with the uh, proceeding. Constantine organized the council along the lines of the Roman Senate. Hosius of Cordoba may have presided over its deliberations. He's probably one of the papal legates from the Roman side. Eusebius of Nicomedia probably gave the welcoming address. And this is the agenda. The first one is an Arian question regarding the relationship between God the Father and the Son, because that's a question. 
the church worshiped Jesus from the beginning, from the very beginning. They worshiped him as God. But then the question came, who he is praying to? We talk about one God. How can he be God and also talking to God? Then they had to be two. But the, the Old Testament said, but God is one. So how are we going to resolve this issue? So this was the Aryan question. Um, so they said, so one in divine purpose only, or also one in being. So that's the question. Uh, it was around, uh, the second one was about the date of Easter, when should they ce celebrate Easter? And the Malaysian schism in Asyut, this is the current city in, in Egypt now, where Bob Alexander has suffered from this bishop under his care, who took upon himself to ordain other bishops and take care of the leadership of the church as a single man. Other things that they discussed in this uh, council, organizational structure of the church, dignity standards of the clergy, reconciliation of the lapsed, established norms of public repentance and paganism. So what happens? Uh, this is very important because at, at the time um, when this council started, people had, many Christians had denounced Jesus under pressure. Because remember, Constantine came 312 with the decree of Milan um, the, that actually allowed everybody to worship in whatever manner, whatever deity they want. Before that, the Christians were very much persecuted everywhere and they have many of them had suffered martyrdom, uh, confession, they, they were very close to martyrdom, but they didn't die. Um, the rest, some of the Christians had denied Christ. So they asked the question, what should we do with them? So how we reconcile them? So they started to establish certain uh, norms to accept those who had denied Jesus back into the church. Readmission re to, the, to the church of the heretics and the schismatics, and there is a difference between those. Who is a heretic? Who is teaching something that relates to faith that is not orthodoxy, which is not mainstream. What about the schismatics? They don't teach heretical teaching. They're not actually going on a tangent with faith, but they divide the church some, some other way. Recently happened in the Coptic church where uh, a man who was excommunicated by the church long time ago dragged a priest from the church and a group from the church to say the church is going in the wrong direction. We have to establish new uh, norms of worship. He didn't add anything. He didn't say anything wrong, but started making a secluded group that started church services alone away from the church. That's a schismatic attitude. This is equally dangerous. What happens when those people repent? They, at the church, the Council of Nicaea said, accept them back if they renounce what they had done, including issues when reordination and or rebaptism will be required. What happens if they were, uh, if they baptize, if this priest baptized someone, should we rebaptize them? And this will be a vague debate between the East and the West. Rome always said, accept them, no matter what. And they said, no, if they were baptized under the wrong faith, they need to be rebaptized because their baptism cannot be considered. Liturgical practice, including the place of deacons and the practice of standing at prayer during liturgy and worship and kneeling. For example, the, during the, the, the Feast of Easter, especially, and on Sundays, the church in that council said, no kneeling down, no kneeling down, because that's kept for fasting for penance. Uh, this is the history and the Aryan controversy. Um, the Aryan controversy arose in Alexandria when the newly reinstated Presbyter Arius began to spread doctrinal views that were contrary to those of his bishop Saint Alexander of Alexandria. The dispute issues centered on the natures and relationship of God the Father and the Son of God Jesus. The disagreement sprang from different ideas about the Godhead and what it meant for Jesus to be God's son. Alexander maintained that the son was divine in just the same sense that the father is, co-eternal with the father, else he could not be a true son. If he was not to be divine the same in the same sense that the father is, and, and also at the same time, co-eternal with the Father, had no beginning. 
then he cannot be the true son of God. Arius emphasized the supremacy of the uni and the uniqueness of God the Father, meaning Father alone is almighty and infinite, that therefore the Father's divinity must be greater than the Son. Arius taught that the Son had beginning and that he possessed neither the eternity nor the true divinity of the Father, but was Father, was rather made God only by the Father's permission and power, and that the Son was rather the first and most perfect of God's creatures. Um, you can think of this and how the, for example, Jehovah's Witness today, they say uh, Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Um, and he was the first heretic, correct? That is according to the, the Judaizers were before, but Arian is the, hist, in history, is the first name for a heretic that started the church on a Christian hunt on nature okay. of Christ, all that stuff. Okay, we can stop here. If you think we should, we should have enough here and we can back, come back again if we need to. I mean, it's interesting to know how did they answer that. And uh, there's certain terms started to appear in this discussion, like the word osea means essence uh, or, su uh, or substance. Hypostasis, uh, which is um, uh, uh, a person, nature, feces. Prosopon person, this is more Greek. They bore different meanings drawn from pre-Christian philosophers. This is all from Greek philosophy. They, they, they leaned on Greek philosophy for defining terms because the church had not used any of those terms yet. But because of this fight, they had to put things into terminology. They had to do that. So the terminology of theology started to emerge. Uh, so that they needed to do this to clarify things and to have one understanding of everything until they were cleared up. The word homoosia, this is the one. Homoosia. Homoosion is a Christian theological term, most notably used in Nicene Creed for describing Jesus as the same in being or same in essence with God the Father. The same term was later also applied to the Holy Spirit in order to designate him as being um, I don't know how to get that back. Um, in order to designate him as being same in essence with the father and the son. Those notions became cornerstones of theology in Nicene Christianity and also present one of the most important theological concepts within the Trinitarian doctrinal understanding of God. We're going to understand the Trinity. We have to understand this homo osion or homo osius. And this word was, as far as we know, it, it, it is uh, in, introduced by Saint, uh, Saint Athanasius as the key word. And this is actually the word that bugged the Arians. They hated this word. They hated it big time and said, you cannot say that. Um, now, and this is the story I told you about. According to legendary accounts, debate became so heated that at one point, Arius was struck in the face by Nicholas of Myra, who would later be canonized. The account is almost certainly apocryphal as Arius himself would not have been present. He was not there. So they, they say that in the story of St. Nicholas. Um, it's not for sure, really, but there's icons that say that uh, St. Nicholas was, was involved in this. Much of the debate hinged on the difference between being born or created and being begotten. Arians saw that these are essentially the same. Followers of Alexander did not. The exact meaning of many of the words used in the debates at Nicaea were still unclear to speakers of other languages. Greek words like essence, osea, substance, as nature faces person pre Christian philosophers could not be in, uh, entail misunderstandings until they were cleared up. Okay, they had their argument, and the argument, the contra argument, and the result of the debate is here declared that the son was the true God. So, eventually, uh, I think the head of the council said, Enough discussion after many days, I want the uh, the question to be answered. He asked the bishops, what did you receive from the apostles? We're talking about 
the beginning of the fourth century. So we're not far away, very far away from the apostles. He said, what did you receive from the apostles and their, and their, and their uh, disciples? What did you know about Jesus? How was how he to be treated? And every bishop said, almost all of them, th those who were non-Aryan, Jesus to be worshipped the same way we worship the Father. There is no difference whatsoever. Then you should have, you should agree that we should actually put that it, one in essence, co-essential with the Father. Declare that the Son was true God, co-eternal with the Father, and begotten from his same substance, arguing that, that such a doctrine best codified the scriptural presentation of the Son, as well as traditional Christian belief about him handed down from the apostles. That's exactly it. Did you receive? They said, that's what we this bishops in the creed, which would form the basis of the creed. It is two pieces, the Nicene and then the Constantinople Creed. Okay, uh, let's go well, back to question. our little presentation here. Go oh, ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> you might have covered this before. So all of these councils took place back when the church was all like one unified church. Is that correct or no? One body, yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Until, I would say, until this. See this? Do you see mm -hmm. where my arrow is? Yeah. Council this is the beginning of all, all the troubles. This is it. When we're going to start having a, a, a division in the church. And then from there, things started to get bad. Um you know, sometimes I think of this as, I, why, Lord, why you allowed your church to be divided? And sometimes I say, maybe it is actually for the best, because um, it kind of kept things from getting very sour, especially when we talk about Roman church in the, in the dark times when things went really bad, really, really bad. So this may be God's way of protecting the other branches of the church from suffering the same fate. So uh, it's like a, a, a blessing in disguise. So the second question comes, okay, so Jesus is God, true God of true God, and he's equal to the Father. And whatever we think of the Father, we should think of the Son, except one thing, that the Father is the begetter, is the Father, and the Son is the begotten. The Father is not begotten. The Father was not incarnated. The Father was not crucified. But what it belongs to the divinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three of them are completely equal without any, any difference in, in any way. So comes the second question. Um, so how did Jesus, who is born of St. Mary and have divinity, can be one person? Now we focus on Christ here. So the question from 325 to 381 started to say, okay, now we get it, that Jesus is true God of true God, but he came, he came from heaven. He didn't start from St. Mary. He's actually eternal. So how can he be one person? If there is a person that's coming from heaven and there's a human being that is from St. Mary, how can we reconcile the two, the two nature, natures into one being? This was very difficult in the beginning. It's easy now, but now before it was not easy until it was kind of clarified. There is this guy here, Apollinarius. This is the main one. Apollinarius, this guy, said, I will solve this for you. Jesus didn't have a human soul. The divine being that came down from heaven, the eternal son of God, the word, is the spirit of the body who animated the body. Sounded very easy solution, end of the story. The church said, never. Because St. Athanasius said already, before, this is going back, Athanasius had died already, but he had written this book, The Incarnation of the Word, and he said, and everybody was convinced that this is true, Jesus came to take our nature on himself, to redeem it, and to bring it to God the Father. So St. Athanasius said something very profound. He said, what Jesus did not assimilate, what did he not take from us, will not be redeemed. So that means if Jesus didn't take a human soul, there would be no redemption for human soul. It would only be the body. But it's very clear that Jesus didn't come to 
our carcasses, our bodies. He came to save the whole human being. So he had to assimilate everything. So the fathers of the church had then, using St. Athanasius' formula, said, Jesus took what's ours. He did not omit the soul of a human. He had taken a human soul and a human body to be a human being. So then this was condemned. And there's another one who his name is Macedonius. And the Macedonian said the Holy Spirit is not divine, is, is, a, is a power, energy, or a created being. And the church also did condemn this. And um, so he, uh, this was the, the, the Council of Constantinople. And to affirm the divinity of the Holy Spirit, the church continued on the creed. Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, meaning that we know that he's equal. Who spoke through the prophets, and then in one holy universal apostolic church, in one baptism for the remission of sins, and we await the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. I mean, that's the second part. So this is the Nicene part, where we talked about the divinity of Christ. This one is about the Holy Spirit, the church, and the resurrection. And this becomes the Constantinople part. So you have the Nicene Constantinople Creed. One continues to the other. Now we should, I think we should stop here and then we continue next time. But let's say our Father, in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, make us worthy, O Lord, say thank you, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive to trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. And ever. May the love of God the Father and grace is only begotten, Son Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you.